Eric, thank you for, uh, to MIT, uh, for allowing me to take this job. I, I think I, I was appointed a little over a year ago. I started a little over, a little less than a year ago. And I think I'm still known mainly as the college dropout that MIT hired to run the Media Lab. And uh, hopefully, pretty soon, I'll be known for a little more than that. Um, but it, it's a completely full-time job, even though they said it wouldn't be. Um, so I don't really have time to do much of anything else. But, um, but it isn't kind of interesting. I was having breakfast with one of my venture capital friends. And we were talking about how just about every um, investment that's a home run is usually not a unanimous decision of the investment committee and is usually kind of contrarian. And when you're contrarian and you're right, you look like a genius. And when you're contrarian and you're wrong, you look sort of stupid squared. So hopefully we'll look like geniuses soon. But, um, but I, one thing that's amazing about MIT and the Media Lab is, as you can see from my bio, I'm interested in everything. Um, and there are very few institutions in the world where you can be interested in everything and still have a job. And, look focused, because I've realized at the Media Lab, every single thing I'm interested in, which is a lot, there's somebody who's more interested in it and has a PhD in it working at the Media Lab. And so what's great about the Media Lab is I'm able to now take all of these sort of chaotic variety of interests, park them at the Media Lab, focus on the Media Lab, and feel like I'm, I'm focused on one thing, which is actually true. So, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be at MIT, and I never in my life thought I would be at an academic institution. I still, it doesn't feel like an academic institution and, and that I think um, I would credit a lot of the MIT DNA for that. But, um, but it's interesting because I, I grew up being very sort of anti-establishment, self-learner, really hated academics. Um, and I sort of figured it out as I went along. But then I realized that the Media Lab, the DNA, and MIT generally, and more specifically at the Media Lab, the DNA is really, really, sort of resonates with us self-learners. And so I want to talk a little bit about innovation, um, learning. So I always used to say, I hate being educated, but I love to learn. And the sort of the MIT really helps um, foster that kind of thing. And so my view of education has changed. But, but I, I want to, um, it was funny, because Eric was talking about obedience. I want to do a, a quick poll with everybody. So, so I'm, in a minute, I'm going to have you hold up your hands. And I want you to put up a number of fingers from 0 to 10. And the number of fingers I want you to put up is how good do you think you are at painting? 10 being awesome, Picasso. Zero, I never paint. And then sort of five halfway. So everybody put up your hands and say, how good are you at painting? OK, so probably an average of about five, right? Now, I'm going to do, do another test. How good were you when you were in kindergarten? Right? So now I see like an average of about eight and a half, nine. Right? So what happened between kindergarten and today that made you worse at painting? And I think that's a really important thing to think about because, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> um, there, there's a variety of reasons. You can say that maybe you're, you're but, but fundamentally, I think that we have created a system that makes us less creative or at least makes us think we're less creative. And obedience is one of them. You know, a lot of, once, in kindergarten, the point isn't to be obedient, the point is to be creative. And so um, Eric mentioned Mitch Resnick, his group is called Lifelong Kindergarten. Because we believe that kindergarten is a great way to learn. You get interested in stuff, you mess around, and you figure out what you need to learn in order to do the stuff that you need to do. But after you get into first grade, it starts to be kind of ordered, structured, um, very kind of left brain stuff. And as we start to focus and teach people to be on time, teach people to listen, and teach people to be obedient, um, we're kind of squeezing out, crowding out some of the other parts of our brain that lets us be disobedient, creative, be painters, and things like that. And I think that we understand more and more today that the creative element is an essential element. The risk-taking element is an essential element in innovation and thinking. And so I, I want to sort of just start out there, and I want you to think a little bit about how do we bring that confidence that you had back in kindergarten and the interest that you had, the fact that you were interested in everything and interested in painting, how do we build that into our system? Because I think that's an essential component um, to whether we're talking about education or um, innovation. And one thing I'll talk about is, um, for, first of all, in, before the internet, so I mean, there are different days that you can, you can cite as the beginning of the internet. 
But I, I was in media, so it's funny because this conference is about media also. Um, I was in television, motion pictures, um, um, magazines, newspapers, mostly working in Japan. And I saw this career ladder that every career ladder I saw was about a 20, I was in my early 20s, it was about 20 years before I would ever get to a position where I had enough authority to be creative. And then I realized by the time I'm 45, which I am now, and back then when I was 20, I thought all 45 year olds were not creative. I, I, <clears throat> I thought that, and obviously I was wrong, um, but I, I, I said, I'm not gonna wait, I don't wanna wait 20 years before I have any authority to do anything. And then the internet came out, and the internet changed my life because I realized the internet was gonna change everything, especially media, and the internet didn't, what allowed you to connect without asking permission, allowed you to, anyone to participate. And so I pivoted in the late 80s, early 90s, and dumped media and said, I'll see you guys later, and I started working on building the internet. And to me, life before the internet and after the internet are sort of essentially two different worlds, and I think that it's fundamentally changing um, human beings. And so I call before internet BI. Life was simple, you know, things move slowly. <laughs> Um, it's kind of Newtonian in a, in a cute sort of way. You could predict what happens when these things collide because the objects were of a certain size and a certain speed. After internet or AI, things become complex, things become fast, things become big, things become small. But fundamentally, you find out that Newtonian laws are actually local ordinances and that the world is kind of unpredictable and we haven't yet figured out how the world works. So there are lots and lots of books about how complicated and complex and unpredictable and terribly difficult the world is, but there really aren't very many books or uh, theories on how you survive in this space. And, um, but we do know it's disruptive and we do know lots of companies are going out of business. It's fun for some people, but it's not fun for other people. But let's talk a little bit about what innovation looks like after internet. So one of the first companies I built was uh, one of the first commercial internet service providers in Japan. And my comp competition at the time were the telephone companies um, trying to create this standard called X25 with ITU's predecessor um, called CCITT. And if you look on this chart, um, you have big governments were sending experts, mostly wearing suits and ties, to these uh, intergovernmental agencies where they would sit around and plan and anticipate every problem and predict every outcome and try to really figure it all out. And they were really smart and they would create reams and reams of reports until the standards you could measure by the metric tons or by meters. And those specifications were so huge and so complex that then you had to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in large institutions with thousands of developers to turn those specs into products. And we use them in like 3G phones and all that. Those are all sort of this old style of experts big standards, governments, and big companies creating network infrastructure. And this was okay when you were designing things where you can't change it later. You know, when you deploy something and you can't change it later, you kind of have to make sure you get it right. You've got to mitigate the risk. The internet, on the other hand, was kind of like this. We were all connected to each other. You had 12-year-olds. You've got governments and venture capitalists. And we're all kind of figuring out the standards as we went along. This was really a competition between centralized innovation by the experts and decentralized innovation by sort of academics and whoever happened to be around. And the X25, by the way, when, when I was rolling out the internet in Japan, I remember these big reports by the law professors saying the internet's illegal. How can you connect these countries without bilateral agreements? How can you, who's taking the risk? You know, there are all these things going on. And even today, if you drill down and you think about who actually runs the internet, when I was on the ICANN board, I sat around and met the root server operators. You know, they're a bunch of weird, crazy volunteers. You know? And when all of the root servers went down, except for F, which is run by Paul Vixie, who's a crazy guy, a good friend of mine, but, and the FBI came and said, well, you know, you gotta help us replicate this. He says, you will never be able to find the kind of people that are running my servers, and you will never be able to put the servers in the kind of countries I have them to back stuff up. So you can't replicate this in government. And every layer of the internet, the backbone, is run by a bunch of crazy volunteers. And we're building our whole infrastructure. And it's kind of scary if you think about it. So when we were building the internet, a lot of the really control lockdown people were really afraid. Um, today, we just sort of ignore that part. But, but, what, but what's, what's important is that the internet won. And this was the triumph of distributed innovation over centralized innovation. And 
It won kind of for a variety of reasons, because the internet was neat, because it was actually networks, but it looked more like software. You can kind of change it as you went along. We screwed up a few things. We ran out of IP addresses. Spam happened because we didn't design our, we didn't anticipate it in the email protocol. But we kind of healed over, you know, everyone thought that you'd have to fix the network to fix spam. But it turns out we were able to fix it on the edges. We're now kind of figuring out hacks to figure out it, to fix the IP addresses before IPv6 rolls out. So, but we were able to deal with it because the internet is really about kind of um, evolutionary, sort of build it as you go innovation. Um, this is my toilet, and <clears throat> this is also the first commercial internet service provider point of presence in Japan. Um, that's a VT100 terminal that only half the screen worked. There's a little uh, Cisco AGS over there, and uh, I think there's a Sun. Um, but, but this could never have been deployed by a telephone company. They would have, paid, they would have spent millions of dollars. Everything would be government stamped, be locked down. We built the spec and the specs would have been this high. This, you know, I just went and downloaded and had a bunch of hackers download the RFCs and we just sort of strung it together. It didn't work at the beginning. We kept trying and there we go. It's online and we've, we, we got a license and ran with it. But what's also important is none of this equipment is licensed. Back then, for the other telephone networks, you actually had to have government licensed things that you could only connect those to the network. This was because the philosophy of the internet was you can connect anything to it you take your own responsibility, and it was the freedom to hack, the freedom to innovate. And what's also tremendously important is that this costs probably less than $10,000 for all this stuff, because we bought it all junk used stuff. Um, but this lets us go. David Weinberger, um, who's at the Berkman Center, um, has a great book called Small Pieces Loosely Joined. And this is a, I, I, I love this metaphor, because this is the image that the internet is. It's about lots of small groups of people, many of them students, and they're connected by loose standards. So if you think about those specs that the government, um, inter governmental agencies created, the, the re reverse is the Internet Engineering Task Force. They, first of all, we're humble. I mean, we call our specifications RFCs, requests for comment. You know, they're very humble. And, and they're short. You can usually read them sort of over lunch. And then by the afternoon, you can write stuff about it. And also, the pieces are small. Whether you look at the team that created the first browsers, the first you know, FTP, they're all teams of like two or three people. And even the big services like Facebook and Twitter, they're all small teams of people. And the other thing is they don't try to anticipate every possible use. In fact, they celebrate when somebody uses their tool in a way they didn't anticipate. And the whole design principle is, can we design it in a way that people can use it in a way that we didn't anticipate without breaking the network? And that's really, and then can we build in the fact that there's going to be failure? And so it's a fundamentally different kind of thinking than, um, big system centrally controlled, which is small pieces loosely joined. And this is also affects the nature of how, how innovation works on the internet. Everybody knows this, Moore's Law. I'm going to skip this slide, but everybody just remember, computers getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, so low cost networks, which is what the internet did, it substantially decreased the cost of distribution and the cost of collaboration. And Moore's Law and open source software that was enabled by um, the network um, substantially diminish the cost of computing and computation and building systems. So if you think about it, when, when Google was started, probably they had mostly open source stack, a standard PC, PC plugged it into the Stanford network um, or Yahoo, and it just ran without very much cost. If a phone company had done it, it would probably cost $500 million, taken 10 years and wouldn't work, right? Um, <clears throat> And so what happens when you have low cost of innovation? Well, the whole model changes. So I'm also a venture capitalist. So in the old days, or today in certain fields, you get some MBA to write a business plan, you go raise money, you hire a bunch of engineers, and you build the thing. This is the old style of venture capital, and this is the old style of innovation before we had this internet boom. Today, what you do is you build the thing, you raise the money, and then you figure out what you're doing. <coughs> and whether that's Twitter or Google or Facebook or any of these guys. But, you know, this is really important because think, and, and this is true for non-commercial stuff too. Like think about somebody, one of your students or somebody coming up to you and saying, you know what, I'm going to build the biggest encyclopedia in the world. And the trick is anyone can edit it. You know, you're, you're, what, you're not going to give this guy a desk. But the thing is, he, his cost of innovation was nearly zero. He just did it. Same with Linus 
all these guys, they just do it. And you could not have predicted, and in fact, even though I'm an investor in like Kickstarter and Flickr and Twitter and all the stuff that I boast about, I didn't know which ones were gonna be successful. In fact, some of the ones that I thought were gonna be really successful, like Six Apart, the blogging company, ultimately wasn't. You never really know. But what's neat is the average investment that I make is so small that I can bet on a lot of things. I don't read business plans, by the way. No, it's not a secret. It's, I just bet on people and I go, 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 go. And this is really different because today now, you can build all this stuff without money. So what happened was all these big institutions who had authority and money, they had a monopoly on innovation because they had a monopoly on the ability to try stuff. Well, it turns out now, if you're a couple of kids in a dorm and you can build the thing first and get traction and have you know, doubling every month, well, only a stupid venture capitalist is not gonna invest in a company that's doubling every month, even if you don't have a business model, right? And so now today, the, people are, the money chases these sites that are getting traction. Um, and so it fundamentally changes the nature of risk, which is really, I think this is actually rather significant. So, and by the way, and now I'm in an academic setting, I realize how completely mathematically and scientifically um, s irrelevant these axes are, so just ignore that. Um, <laughs> but in large companies, just imagine this is what the brain of a large company person looks like where they're fundamentally focused on mitigating downside risk, right? Because you can overrun your budget, the markets could go crazy, your sponsors could leave, all kinds of ways to lose tons of money. But growing is a little bit harder, right? You get a little market share here, you get a cut cost here, you get some margin over here, and so you do focus a little bit on upside, but upside's kind of limited. The very few large companies grow geometrically. So you really focus on mitigating risk. This is what the brain of a venture capitalist looks like. So I'm an early stage investor. My average investment is about $100,000. And, um, and I, this happens every week. I've got, you know, I've invested in, by the way, I've invested in hundreds of companies and there are probably only four that I boast about. So, but they're worthy enough that all the rest don't matter. All the failures don't matter. Um, but when, uh, like uh, last week, an entrepreneur called me and said, you know, Joe, we're not doing very well. Um, I think we're gonna run out of money. And I looked at the company, I said, yeah, shut it down. I said, he said, can't you help me, like, introduce me to some investors, sit down with me, work on a model. I said, you know, I think you, you picked the wrong market. Give me another plan. But, because the most I'm gonna lose at this point is $100,000, the money I put in. If I spent a week running around trying to raise money, redoing his business plan, that would be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of my time. The time that's the value of you all sitting here right now for this hour, we could probably start, fund 50 startups, right? And so the sitting around and thinking about it cost or trying to recover your losses cost is always higher in the early stage at least than the money that you put in, which is a really different, difficult thing for some of these downside mitigators to think about. And then if you go to the right side, if you invested $100,000 in Facebook in the first round, I think it'd be worth about a billion dollars today, right? So the way that a venture fund works is usually the one company in your portfolio for each fund, which is about six years or so, is worth more than every other company in the fund. You could get rid of everything. Now, even if you took Facebook out of the fund, for all those funds that have it, probably the second biggest one will still be more than everything else combined. It's this weird power law. And so when Google was growing, and the venture capitalists got together, and they said, oh, we're also in Yahoo. Huh, well, let's make Google the search engine for Yahoo, because they don't seem to be focused on it, and let's make them do the ads. That probably, that transaction probably quadrupled the value of Google instantly. And so what you do, a good venture capitalist does, is they find the things that are growing, and they double down and double down and double down and help those, and then the other guys just say, you know, good luck, move on, come back when you've got another idea. It's a very, very different way of thinking than mitigating risk. It's really, really trying to amplify upside. And I think this is a kind of an important way to think when you think about research and innovation as well, because I think we're really used to this kind of um, directed research and planned model. I, I, and also, again, depending on the lab at MIT, if you're trying to build a radar system or something like that, yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money. You have to make sure you don't screw it up. 
But when you're at places like the Media Lab, where I think my average project probably only is cost less than $100,000, know, I don't sit around and worry about whether these kids have a really good idea or not. I'd rather let them try it and, and see what happens. Um, I remember when I was starting that internet service provider, I was working um, with a Japanese trading company. And they set up a feasibility study company, right? To, and the, the whole cost of my project was $600,000. They spent $3 million on a feasibility study to decide not to spend $600,000. <laughs> and you may laugh, but I would bet in every one of your institutions, you have spent more money deciding not to do something than the total cost of what would have happened if you had tried it, right? And more and more, now I think that I've, I've calculated that at least for consumer internet products, what we call minimum viable product, which is a launchable product, costs about $30,000, takes about three weeks. And so if you think about how much time it costs for you to make the person make a PowerPoint and a budget and a business plan and for you to sit around an investment committee, that's going to cost more than $30,000. So you've got to think about a system that allows that kind of innovation. Um, David Clark, who's over at CSAIL and one of my big um, I'm a big fan. He, he came up with, I, I, I've been using this without attributing it properly until recently. I think he's the one that first said it. But he was one of the first architects of the internet. He uses this phrase, rough consensus running code, which is really important because it's the idea, not you know, everything planned and then built. It's the idea that you just come to a rough consensus and you write code and then you hack on the code and you build. This is actually the fundamental DNA of the internet. And what's important, I think, is that the internet is a philosophy. It's not a chunk of technology. And this is the philosophy. The philosophy is rough consensus running code, freedom to connect, freedom to hack, freedom to innovate. Um, and, and that ties to, to um, Eric's stuff about open courseware, which is tremendously important. It's open access. What this allows you to do in this, 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 this philosophy is also about agility, right? Because what happens is when you have um, rough consensus running code. You build first, think later in, in many ways. And, and agility is really about being able to make things very quickly because you really don't know until you try it is one other part of agility. This is actually really important in innovation. So you can st still go to the Wayback Machine and see this page. This is YouTube when they launched 2005. Um, you could log in and you would say the default was, I am male seeking everyone between 18 and 45, upload video. It was a dating site with video, OK? Um, it didn't work very well. People didn't like uploading their videos. It just was maybe could have worked later, but it, it didn't work. Now, the key thing here is they didn't sit around with this business model for very long, because it didn't work very well. And they dumped a bunch of code, and they pivoted. And I remember talking to some of them when they pivoted, and they said, you know, we're, we're like Flickr for video. Maybe. I don't, I don't see the traction, what's going on. Unfortunately, I didn't invest then. That was too bad. Um, and then they went and said, you know, this MySpace thing, it's growing like crazy. Let's turn into the embed tool for MySpace. And that's what they did. Right? And Google Video had more money. They were, had better technology. But YouTube just latched onto MySpace and just went. Right? And so then Google eventually had to buy YouTube. But what the key here is that if YouTube had spent two years planning and millions and millions of dollars creating this online video dating site, it would have taken a lot of energy for them to decide not to do it. But it's because they released early, released often. And as Reid Hoffman says, if you release and you're not embarrassed by your release, you've released too late. Um, <coughs> but you know, the idea is that you just release. And they figured out very quickly that this wasn't going to work. And, all, and, it hap and this is kind of like just-in-time manufacturing as well, because their inventory of lines of code and their investment of energy and the intellectual property and the patents around this were light enough so that they could dump it without feeling like they were losing a lot. So a lot of companies, a lot of institutions will say lines of code. Oh, we've got teams. We've got IP as if they're assets. Well, they're assets if you're going to be going the same direction forever. But if you're thinking about agility, these turn into liabilities. When I'm with a product team, like we, we, most of my startups, we do like um, one week sprints, right? And so what will happen is after one week, we'll launch the product, and we have the engineers in the room, and they've been working on this like nonstop without sleeping for a week. So they're very kind of, you know, they love this code, and we'll look at it and we'll go, eh. and they, they'll cry because we're going to dump a week of work. But they get over it, right? And sometimes we don't invite them in the room when we make the decision, but, but we, we dump the code. <laughs> 
But imagine if this were two years of code outsourced to somebody with somebody's neck on the line if it's a failure, they're not going to dump the code. They're just going to go with it. And they're going to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And so that's the difference between agile systems and these old waterfall systems. And the reason why Silicon Valley is really beating everyone right now is because they figured out this agility thing. Just about every big internet company, if you go to their chief of executives and ask them to tell the truth, they'll say, we don't believe in strategy. Because by the time you figure out the strategy, the world has changed. We be, believe in agility. And you know, Facebook, with all of its problems, they just launch features every week and change. They've gotten their users used to the idea that every single week, their inter interaction is going to be completely different. But you get used to it, because you see them reacting to everything very fast. Um, John Seeley Brown is another one of my um, um, favorite thinkers. And he has this term, power of pull, which is the ability to pull things from the network as you need them, rather than stocking them and pushing them from the center. And this ties, again, to, I think, online learning in a really interesting way. Because in the old days, before the internet, BI, you, know, you kind of had to stock all this stuff in your brain because you never knew when you were going to be connected again. Because you might end up in some mountain and have to solve um, you know, a calculus problem or something. right? But today, you can go online. You can find people. You can collaborate. And you can usually pull the things as you need them. Right? And so I don't think we've, I mean, people are talking about the flipped classroom and stuff like that, which is really great. But I still think that we are kind of focused a little bit too much on getting everything in everyone's brain and like putting them in their like, you know, sort of outward bound stuff so that they're ready for the world instead of kind of this idea that you've got to keep learning as you go. And it's more important to learn how to pull than it is to learn how to stock. And I think we're kind of forcing students to read the encyclopedia from cover to cover before they're allowed to do anything, rather than thinking of the encyclopedia as a reference that they can pull from. And I think that's one thing that um, we can work on. I think serendipity is really important. Just about every good thing that's ever happened to me is, I feel, because I'm lucky. And um, serendipity is actually scientific. There's a really interesting series of studies. Um, this guy, actually, I don't know if it's a guy. It could be a she. I have to be careful. I have this Japanese sort of um, um, thing of saying he. Um, <laughs> but there was a person who did a study, and what he, actually it is a he. He, um, <laughs> he, 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 he ran an ad asking people um, who are extremely unlucky or extremely lucky to respond to this and participate in this trial. And what they did was they gave them newspapers and said, count every photo in the newspaper. And there were 42 photos. And big, huge headline fonts that says, there are 42 photos in this newspaper in one of the pages. And another page that says, you win $250 if you tell the examiner that you saw this. And so all the unlucky people diligently count the photos and miss the headlines. And the lucky people go, oh, wow, cool. Hey, give me $250. bucks. i am done. 42 pictures. You know? And it turns out almost completely that fall, it fell, they fell into those two categories, the people who were unlucky weren't looking at the peripheries. There's another study. If you put a dot on a screen, and you put things in the periphery, and you, you ask people to look at the dot, they'll see all the peripheral vision. But you give a financial reward to somebody and say, I'm going to give you 10 bucks if you watch that dot. It, all the peripheral vision disappears. And peripheral vision is really, really important for serendipity, because serendipity is all about finding those opportunities around you and then embracing them. And if you don't see those opportunities, you can't be lucky. And if you plan everything, and you focus and focus and focus, you really don't get lucky because you're not looking for that luck. And part of this is pattern recognition. Um, I don't know how many of you are mushroom hunters. It was funny because I was talking to a bunch of Swedes, and everybody raised their hand. Um, <coughs> but this is what mushroom hunters look at. They look at these complex patterns. And if you, just, if you study you know, vision, there's different theories, but approximately only 1% of your field of view you're actually focused on when you're focused. Everything else, your cognitive brain sort of fills in and makes it up. So it turns out when you're looking for mushrooms, the way you do it is you stop looking at anything, and then the mushrooms pop if you're good at it. They pop up in patterns. The hunters of animals do the same thing. They, they look out, and then they can start to see the little movements in the periphery. But if you're focused on something, you can't. Right? So, so what's interesting is, I mean, it's not counterintuitive. It's kind of obvious. But if you, the more you focus, the less peripheral vision and the less pattern recognition you have. And pattern recognition is also a really essential part of, um, of serendipity. And 
at the Media Lab, that's kind of what I'm trying to get people to do, is to start thinking about peripheral vision and start thinking about pattern recognition. It's really, really hard because we're so used to obedience, focus being good things and plans being good things, but it turns out it's not the best way to discover, and discovery is a really important part of invention. Um, I'm going to give a quick example of the power of pull, because I think that one was, I, this example will, will articulate a little bit better. And I'll go through it kind of quickly. But so March 11th, it turns out, was the day I was being interviewed at the Media Lab. So it was kind of a weird day, because the big earthquake happened in Japan. And my wife and family were in Japan, so I panicked. And I called my friend. I had a kid who was doing, um, um, he was an analog uh, hacker. So I, because I, I wanted Geiger counters for our house, because I wanted to figure out what was happening. And then I had a friend in LA who was working on visualizing um, uh, radiation measurements that we're, we were getting from the government. And then in, within a couple of days, I was able to find the guy who did the Geiger counter um, um, measurements in Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. And then I was able to find a hardware hacker from MIT named Bunny, and, and then the hacker spaces, and a designer from IDEO. And then I was, um, and um, Ray Ozzy, it turns out, was really interested in, in these devices. And we was able to put together a pretty neat team within a couple of days. And then within a week or so, we had a pretty broad team. So we had, by the end, we had, you know, new, um, um, we had physicians who understand stood, um, nu nuclear ex exposure. We had web designers. We had people who could make Geiger counters, people who had sensor networks. And within a week, we, I was able to go from knowing nothing about radiation to a pretty, probably one of the best teams in the world in actually responding to this thing. It was multinational. Um, and you know, we were using all the different social tools. We got together face-to-face -to -face in Tokyo. We changed the name from Radiation Network to um, Safecast, and we, we were, we, and we were off. And we were able to raise money from Knight Foundation, from Kickstarter. You know, we got a bunch of people to pledge money um, to send Geiger counters to Japan. We're doing another one right now. And then we realized there aren't enough Geiger counters, and they won't be because it turns out the sensor manufacturing is limited. So we got to go mobile. So we created the B-Geigy. It looks like a bento box, so it's called b Geigy. And we, we, we said, we're going to mount them on cars and drive around. And so in the hacker spaces, we created the thing with GPS. And Tesla lent us a car, which was cool. So we drove around in a Tesla. Um, and, uh, but we had got a lot, lot of local volunteers. It was really interesting because the, um, the Americans who came to the villages, I don't know if you've been to Japan, but the rural villages are a little bit skeptical about Americans and foreigners in general. But the Japanese would come in these hazmats the government, measure and go home without telling them anything. And so we were going in and we were explaining, okay, well, you've got a hot spot here, and it turns out that the cesium that's stuck to your roof is irradiating your kid's room on the third floor 10 times more strongly than the first floor, so you should move the kids to the basement. And we were teaching them how to decontaminate everything. And um, it was really a moving moment because they put together a nonprofit and they said, um, you guys have helped us so much. Um, we, uh, the people of Fukushima, are creating a nonprofit. So if this ever happens anywhere else in the world, we're going to go and we're going to say we're from Fukushima. We're here to help, to try to give back. You know, and this was a really wonderful kind of citizen to citizen uh, communication thing. And it was all just happened by the seat of our pants. No plans, no money. Um, and so we went into the exclusion zone, and we were telling the cops standing there that they probably shouldn't be standing there without protection. And then we started doing visualizations of maps to try to let people understand. But it's really tricky because you can't really tell people what's good or what's bad. You just have to give raw data. Um, and some of the students at the Media Lab jumped in and started doing their thesis on the visualization of the data, which is pretty tricky. One really interesting thing that we realized was that people were being evacuated from lower radiation areas to higher radiation areas. Bad news. Um, and then we also found that even in the same town, you'd get you know, huge variations, and that these helicopter flyovers that the government was doing was completely irrelevant, that in one city, you would have completely different levels. And so we, we, we now have finally, after a year, become finally somewhat established and working with the big guys. Um, so you know, we have 150 volunteers. We've got lots of Geiger counters. We're the largest single database of um, radiation measurements um, in the world. Um, and we're providing all the data without any copyright using the Creative Commons um, public domain dedication so that now what we're trying to do is get all the medical guys to start, because there's all these rumors that causes bloody noses and blah, 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 blah. But this is an opportunity to take a tremendous amount of data and learn a lot from it. But it only works if people share the data and allow us to do correlations. And, and, and we're still having a lot of resistance. Um, the other thing that we did 
was we designed a new Geiger counter. Because it turns out, if you look at the history of Geiger counters, there's a little peak of innovation around Geiger counters, like around Chernobyl, around Three Mile Island, and then it kind of goes. So nothing had been innovated for a while. And so we built this design. This is Bunny's design. And so this is the new thing. The cool thing is we're using the open hardware dedication. So anybody can download the design and build the Geiger counter themselves. Um, and open hardware you know, allows, you know, so there's somebody who made a Geiger counter synthesizer, Geiger counter art. Um, but at the Media Lab and, and all over MIT, what's happening is the cost of building this stuff is going so cheap that they can download this and they can build it. You can prototype rapidly with 3D um, printers, laser cutters, milling machines. So the cost of prototyping has gone down and the cost of manufacturing is going down. We've been manufacturing these Geiger counters in China, but there are a lot of supply chain companies that will do most of the sourcing, designing, and manufacturing for you. So to get back to the idea of innovation, what's kind of interesting is if you think about, okay, well, what was it that made those internet startups able to go off and do their own thing was the cost of innovation and distribution going down to nearly zero. Well, that's happening right now to hardware. Just look at the, so I don't think they announced it, but there was a leak that um, Facebook is getting into mobile phones, right? Um, Google already is, they bought Motorola. And then HP, who has these four or five year um, roadmaps, are getting out of hardware lines. If you get back to the agility thing, it's these agile companies who realize that now that the cost of doing this stuff is so cheap that hardware is now about being agile. Winning in the hardware game is about being agile. And if you're not agile and you have these four or five year roadmaps, you, you can't compete anymore. And what this means also, well, okay, now you've got Facebook and Google, they're big companies, but this formula of pushing the innovation to the edges and allowing the startups to try things at no cost because the kids, in, like we, we just had this, this toy called Makey Makey that some of my students did at the Media Lab. They just put it on Kickstarter. They raised over half a million dollars already for it. And so the fundraising has also now become very, very um, frictionless. And so, so I think that the explosion of innovation on the edges, and by the way, academic labs are edges in, 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 the, in sort of the, the framework that I'm talking about where centralized are like Bell Labs and, 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 and these big IBM and these big companies. So, so I think what happened in software is going to happen in hardware, and this year is really the year where the tipping point is really coming. And then another thing that's happening, this is um, happening in our lab as well with Joe Jacobson, and he's created a chip um, or a semiconductor uh, system that now can put together genes sequences and manufacture genes at a tremendously low cost and a high rate. Um, so right now, people do it by hand um, in China. So you get six or 700 people and somebody like a Mars will go and have them put together a genetic gene sequence. Um, but it's limited because people screw up. If you remember, I don't know how many of you remember, in the old days, before we had integrated circuits, people by hand put the transistors together and you were limited to two or 3,000 transistors of complexity because people would screw up and the yield would go down after it got too complex. But once you were able to do it on a printed circuit, then suddenly the complexity went up because the error rate went down. Well, that's ha gonna happen in biotech and Moore's law is about to hit biotech. And when that happens, biotech innovation is also, I mean, you still have clinical trials and a bunch of things that make biotech slightly different. But generally speaking, you're gonna, when Moore's law and the internet and information technology hits any of these fields, the cost of innovation goes down and it gets pushed to the edges and the big guys lose control. So that's something to think about. Um, you know, so, so these are some principles that, and by the way, this is a work in progress because um, I just sent this to the faculty list and everybody's arguing with me about these. Um, <laughs> but I believe that these are my principles. I think resilience instead of strength. Don't try to prevent failure. Allow failure, allow yield, and how do you bounce back? Pull instead of push is the power of pull. Take risk instead of being risk adverse. Systems instead of objects. Compasses instead of maps. Practice instead of theory. Obviously, some of my professors think that theory is important. Um, disobedience instead of compliance. Now, this one, I'm glad Eric left. Um, <coughs> but you, know, you don't get a Nobel Prize for doing what you're told. You have to question authority and think for yourself. And being disobedient doesn't necessarily mean unrespectful, you know, it, disrespectful. It means thinking for yourself and questioning authority and not just doing as you're told. Um, and, and crowds instead of experts. A lot of my faculty are experts, so they don't like that either. Um, learning instead of education, I think, is important. 
So let me just wrap up by just talking a little bit about the Media Lab. Our um, degree is Media, Arts, and Science. I'm learning a little bit about the history of the Media Lab. I think we were trying to get the word communications, but all the other labs wouldn't let us have it. And they said, but media, ew, you can have that. And so we got media. <coughs> um, and um, it turns out media is a great word because media is plural for medium. And so we use it the way I interpret it is, well, anything that has a medium of expression. And we're part of the architecture school, so we have this atelier model where you sort of build stuff. So anything that you can build stuff, whether it's a gene sequence or an opera or software or hardware or food, is um, a medium. And arts and science, that's the balance. And when you know, Jerome Wiesner and, and Nicholas Negroponte built the thing, it really was kind of the um, department of none of the above, the place where all the misfits came. You know, we had great people like Marvin Minsky and Seymour Pepper, but it was really about collecting people who didn't fit in anywhere else because we were kind of the catch-all. Um, and this is the kind of atelier model that we have where we, we have people just building things. You don't sit around and talk about stuff, you build stuff. And, um, and it's really this practice over theory because I think um, nothing against some of the scholarly people that we have in this room, but a lot of scholarly people especially in fields like economics, they have these theories and then they do these tests and when the tests and the reality don't match the theory, they go, something must be wrong with reality. You know, we're, we're, we're like, we're the opposite. You know, we, we, if it works in practice, there must be a theory, let's just keep going. Um, so, so the Media Lab was, this is just some stats, 26 um, faculty, about 140 students, 300 or so projects. I think one unique thing is we have mostly corporate sponsors right now. And so what that does is it gives all of the lab a lot of interaction with outside people. So our um, design constraints are sort of founded in, 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 in somewhat practical things. But the key thing here is that it's undirected research funds. So even though the companies give us the money, they don't tell us what to do. Um, or they can try, but. <laughs> um, and it's diverse. All of the faculty are in different fields. So we cover a lot of breadth for our 26 faculty. Um, and we are doing a faculty search right now. We use the word anti-disciplinary. So we're looking for creative and anti-disciplinary people. And what that means, it means a couple of things. It means, one, that if you could do what you wanted to do in any discipline or in some other lab, just go do it there. Only come to the Media Lab if it's the only place in the world that you could do this weird combination of things that you want to do. And that goes for students as well. And also, <clears throat> antidisciplinary means an interdisciplinary group or an interdisciplinary team is when you've got an MBA and a physicist and a designer working together. Wow, that's super interdisciplinary. And that's great. But what we say when we're antidisciplinary is you can't say, well, I don't do design. No, no, you have to do design. You have to know how to build stuff. You, know, you have to know how to write code. You have to appreciate art. <coughs> and everybody has different areas of strength but everybody's got to somehow be able to do everything, and there's no such thing as it's not my job. <coughs> and the other thing is, when, when I got to the Media Lab, one thing, the Media Lab was created 28 years ago, if you remember, this is BI, right? This is like before the internet, this is before the personal computer. So it's really important when Nicholas Negroponte wrote Being Digital and you know, the personal computer revolution, empowering you know, man-machine interface and empowering the individual, that was really important stuff. But now that we've got the internet, it's really much more about connecting with the rest of the world. It's really about looking at the systems rather than the object, looking at networks. And so to me, the Media Lab felt a little bit like a container also. It was, like, it was connected, but not super connected. So I've been trying to turn the Media Lab into a platform, focus less on products, focus more on ecosystems, and to try to create what I'm calling a Media Lab network. So not a network of Media Labs, but a Media Lab network where we have lots of collaborators. We've been creating an open platform. We're um, you know, publishing everything online using Creative Commons and trying to um, also redo the IP policy and all these other things so that we can participate um, more broadly within MIT as well as the rest of the world. And so if we're lucky, that, that, that will um, work and make things more interesting. Thank you.